Hello, I'm Ivory August at Cornell University, and what I'm going to talk about today is how do you get set up in an independent career as a faculty member? So you got your first faculty position. Now what? Well, first, congratulations. It's great. It's very difficult to get a faculty position these days. But there are some things that I think you should be thinking about very early so that you're off to a good start in a successful career in science. First, don't wait until the official start date. I know you're all excited about starting as an assistant professor or assistant investigator or senior scientist, but you need to be thinking very strategically about how to get your lab started. First, before you start, as soon as you have accepted that offer, start to get your regulatory approvals. Now, You've been working in a lab as a postdoc, you know you need regulatory approvals for working with mice, for working with recombinant DNA, radiation safety, chemical safety, human samples. All these things need approval, prior approval, before you start working. And so what you want to do is to get started on all of these approvals before you actually start your position, so that when you start your position, all of these things are in place. So what you can do then is find out if you can get access to the regulatory approval system at least four to six months before you get started. This might mean you need to get into the system and get your email address set up or some way of getting access to the regulatory system. Most institutions will be flexible in allowing you to get access to the system so you can start in your approvals. Because as you probably know, it can take up to six months to get approvals for some things. The second thing you should think about is to start to get training and other paperwork done, most of these can be done online if possible. So you can be in San Francisco, be starting your position in Chicago, but you can still do this online. The other thing you should do is get on the phone and consult with the offices that, can, that is responsible for these regulatory approvals. They're usually very helpful and are very willing to work with investigators to get them through the process, particularly the first time you're doing it, because this would be very important. So once you receive your regulatory approvals, you can start shipping reagents. And two of the most important things you can ship are your reagents that you're using that you can store in minus 20 or minus 80, and your animals that you can start your breeding colony. So if you can find someone who can act as a contact person at your new institution, you can start to ship these things. You will have your animal protocol approved if you get your regulatory approval. And so you can start your breeding so that by the time you get to your institution, you will have animals that, with luck, you're ready to start experiments with. The next thing you want to do is start to think about and writing grant proposals. Obviously, you've done very well, you've gotten a faculty position, but now you have to get funding for your work. And so what you want to start to do is, what is the process that you need to do at your new institution to submit a grant proposal? You can write it, but you need to be able to submit it. And so what you should be doing is talking to the staff in the office responsive programs at your new institution. You should find out from them what are the requirements for submitting grant proposals, how far ahead of time do you need, what type of budget they need. You can also ask them to perform searches for you to find funding opportunities, private foundations, other government agencies that would fund the type of work that you do. And you can do all of this before you actually get there so that you can start targeting the types of grants that you'll be writing to fund your work. So, you've done all that, you've shipped your animals, your colony is going great, your reagents are all ready, your lab is set up, now you've started. So what do you do? Well, you should try to get some students. So you should join the graduate programs. In some institutions, this can be as, as simple as sending an email to the director of the graduate program. In other institutions, it's a much more formal process where you actually have to apply, give a research talk, and be voted in by members of the graduate program. So all of these parameters you should find out. You should familiarize yourself with the teaching program. What are the courses that are taught by your department? Even if you're not teaching in those courses, you should have an, an awareness of what that teaching program is. And you should talk to recently appointed faculty members. What have their big experiences? What sort of hiccups do they have so that you can get ahead of that curve and start to act proactively? Most importantly, 
you need to start getting people in your lab. So hiring people is one of the most important things that you'll do to get started on a successful career as a principal investigator. So the first thing you should do is take a deep breath and temper your expectations because you're probably going to be the best person in your lab for some time. And as you look for people, it's unlikely you'll find someone exactly like yourself. The right person is really important. You're not going to hire a plumber to work in your lab. So do you recruit a postdoc first? Do you recruit a student first? Or do you recruit a technician first? Each of these different individuals have different experiences and different things they bring to your lab. A postdoc comes well-trained, probably ready to jump in and do experiments. A student, you have to train a bit before they'll actually be ready to do experiments. Whereas a technician in the right environment can help you set up your lab and get started. And so what I would suggest is you recruit an experienced technician, preferably one that has been at the institution for some time, who knows the institution, who can help you navigate this new institution because you're new. And if they're new, then that can also be an issue. So you hire a technician and they can help you do all your ordering, they can help you navigate other regulatory issues that you need, help you connect with other labs through other technicians. And then perhaps you can recruit a postdoc who can come in and land on their feet and get started on experiments. And so by this time now you've joined the graduate program and now you can recruit students and get started on your lab. Now you should be thinking about promotion and tenure. Even though you've just started, time goes really fast. So you should be really thinking about what do you need to get promotion and tenure. So you should be speaking to your department chair. What is it that is required to get promotion and tenure in a department in your college? Speak to your associate dean for academic affairs. As a postdoc, you probably don't know who that person is, but that person is very important for navigating and shepherding your tenure package when you get there. So you want to talk to that person and find out what the experience is in the college. Importantly, start to build your dossier. You should get a copy of someone who's recently been promoted to see what a successful dossier looks like. And you should be documenting everything that you do when you're doing. Don't wait for four to six years later to try to remember what you did in your first year. If you gave a talk, document it. When you publish a paper, document it. If you give a lecture in a class, document it. So it builds over time. And so by the time you're ready to su submit your dossier, you have everything documented. So you have to publish. So you need to be pacing your publications. You can spend a lot of time on a few papers that will give you a Nobel Prize, or you could spend a lot of time on a lot of papers, but that will demonstrate that you've published a lot. And the important thing is to balance both quality and quantity. You want to be able to publish important work that will establish yourself in the field and get you tenure, but you want to publish enough of it that you've shown that you're productive. So be wary of focusing only on that big paper that will take you four or five years to publish and may not get published until past the date where you come up for tenure. In which case, you'll come up for tenure with no papers. You also don't want to spend too much time publishing small papers that you don't really make an impact in the field until when you come up for tenure, nobody knows what work you've done. So again, balancing quality with quantity. But importantly, you want to show productivity early on. Within a year or two of getting your new lab, you want to have a few papers out so that people know that you've established your independence and you can do this on your own. To do this, you need to manage your time. You need to reserve some time for thinking and writing. If you're teaching, make sure you set scheduled office hours so that students don't drop in every now and again and interrupt your writing. And also, you need to meet regularly with, your, with members of your lab, set aside specific meeting times to meet with them in addition to your lab meeting. That way, you're able to mentor and interact with your students in a one-on-one -on -one way, as well as having lab meeting, but reserving time for yourself so that you can be writing and thinking. Importantly, you need to understand how funding works. You should serve on an NIH study section. The NIH Center for Scientific Review is very happy to allow new investigators to serve on a study section on an ad hoc basis so that they can see how the process works. It's very different from how you imagine it. And it's really eye-opening in the way you write your grants and in the way you approach getting funded. 
you need to budget wisely. They will give you a, a starter package. You will have money that looks like a lot of money to spend. But remember, you also have to get your own funding. So you need to make sure you pace yourself. Startup funds are usually unrestricted and they can provide you with more leeway than grant funds. So you want to try to preserve that as much as possible. So you want to pace your spending. Pay careful attention to how much you're spending each month. Check your burn rate. Check your running costs. How much does your animal colony cost? You can't breed all of these animals because you'll have to pay for them. And get a monthly report of all your available funds. So that way you know each month what you've spent and how much money you still have. So at most universities, you have to perform some service. So you'll, you will have service duties. And in particular, a lot of those service duties, a higher burden is placed on underrepresented faculty within departments because there are usually one or two of you and there might be students that would like to be mentored or students that just come to your office and, and want to interact with you, want to get advice from you. And so it's really important that you manage the time. So first thing you should do is find out what is expected for untenured faculty. Discuss with your chair the expectations for you as an underrepresented faculty member in terms of integrating that service with the service expectations. You should carefully choose those that also satisfy your teaching and your research. In some cases, you can advise summer students who, have, who are from underrepresented groups and that can be considered part of your service duties and also integrated with your research. Learn how to say no. I know that you will feel that you need to meet with every student that comes in who wants to speak with you. But it's important that you manage those interactions. You can set times when you meet with students, just as you do for teaching. And most importantly, for official service requests, make sure that you run those past your chair. And if you're not sure, just ask whoever is asking you to do something to ask your chair first and that will usually take care of it. But it's most important that you protect your time, and even more important that you manage your sense of responsibility in terms of giving back to your underrepresented students with the fact that you need to establish yourself, get your lab going, and become an independent investigator so that you can be successful for a very long time in serving as a mentor to those students. So for more resources, these two websites provide some really good information as to how to make this transition and how to manage all of these things that I just discussed.